Bonjour à toutes et à tous et bienvenue à l'Alliance française ici à la médiathèque du Jourdain. Je suis Émilie Granocio, la nouvelle chef de culture et événements à l'Alliance française. Uh, I will switch to English <laughs> as before, um, but we are really thrilled with this partnership, uh, our continuing partnership with the French Bay Arts Festival. Thank you, Xavier, and thank you, Sophia, for the collaboration. Um, we are thrilled this is the, the first in our three series of heritage events. And um, let me introduce you, first of all, to our uh, moderator, uh, Dr. Isabel Frank, who will introduce herself and today's speaker. Thank you very much for all of you for coming. Thank, Thank you. you. Yes, yes, I will be the moderator, moderator for this very exciting, exciting talk. talk. Uh, I'm currently curator at the Indra and Harry Banga Gallery at City University, where we've been putting on exhibitions for the past seven years, uh, mixing Chinese, European uh, art, and new media. And if you've never been there, I'm just going to put in a little plug here. You should definitely come and visit us in Kowloon Tong. Now, it's my great pleasure to introduce our speaker today, uh, Dr. Estelle Nicholas van Osselt, who is cu currently curator at the Hong Kong Palace Museum. Uh, Dr. Nicholas van Osselt earned her PhD and MA from the University of Geneva, the University of London, and Peking University, studying Chinese and Asian art and archaeology. And for her master's thesis, she won the Prix Arditi in art. Prior to the Hong Kong Palace Museum, uh, Dr. Nicholas van Osselt worked as curator at the Bauer Foundation in Geneva and the Guy and Miriam Ulens Foundation in both Geneva and Beijing. She has curated many exhibitions, including Beyond Boundaries, Cartier and the Palace Museum Craftsmanship and Restoration Exhibition in Beijing in 2019. She has also authored a number of books, including Five Blessings, Coded Messages in Chinese Art. Her latest book, Asia Chic, the influence of Japanese and Chinese textiles on the fashions of the Roaring Twenties received the selection of the Jury Award at the International Art Book and Film Festival in 2020. Please join me in welcoming Dr. Nicholas van Essen. Thank you. Thank you very much. I'm very honored for uh, Isabel to be here with us today too. Thank you, Isabel. <laughs> So, uh, yes, um, today, European people, do you hear me well? Yeah, okay. Today, European people completely forgot um, where a lot of their trees, shrubs, flowers, fruits, vegetables, and herbs came from because they are so easily available in the markets and in the shops. People enjoy them in their gardens or in their plates, However, they, are, they have not always been there, and some of these plants traveled from far away. A lot of them came from Asia and China in particular, through Canton, Hong Kong, and Macau. And this fabulous journey is reflected in, he, in this painting here uh, by Jan Bruegel, um, the elder, representing rare flowers um, what seems to be peonies, mainly, and tulips, in a Chinese blue and white vase. It was made in Brussels in 1625, and you will discover soon how it belonged to today's history. So together, we will consider several aspects of the plant discovery around the world and in China in particular. I will present the adventures of famous plant hunters, among them the exciting life of, of Pierre Poivre and Jean-Baptiste Fusé-Aublet, and the impact of the treasures they brought back to the West. Versailles is a very good example of this botanical history, as it, is, it was one of the first places to receive um, those newly collected plants Moreover, the person in charge of the royal gardens greatly contributed to further exchanges between Europe and China as well. Like Versailles, the old summer palace, uh, served as an experimental ground for new botanical experiments. 
Um, finally, we will end today's story on the Chinese land, considering the quest for tea led by Robert Fortune in the 19th century and the Chinese people's vision of their own world, um, briefly examined through tradition and arts. So that's uh, for today's program. For centuries, uh, Westerners traveled the world and the seas in search for spices. They were dependent on those rare plants used as condiments for cooking, to help for food preservation, as well as in medicine, cosmetics or perfumes. Sometimes spices have been used as money to pay taxes, as gifts or offerings, because these goods were so precious, they were as desirable as gemstones. Um, that's how these treasures motivated numerous explorers to leave for parts unknown. So the quest for spices was already an important business during antiquity. The Greek and Roman empires were avid consumers of exotic plants. They had great needs for cinnamon, that was mainly burned for offerings, ginger, used in medicine for its heating effects and believed to be an antidote against poisons, cloves for its antimicrobial uh, properties, pepper and nutmeg often used to cook or in perfume recipes, and many written sources bring these uses to light. Paintings of a lemon and a cherry tree, both of Chinese origins, were found in one of Pompeii's villa, buried under the volcanic ashes of the Vesuvio in 79. These frescoes reveal the presence of these fruits at a very early stage in the West. However, if those goods were real, their provenance was completely blurred and the most fantastic stories were told about their origin. Herod Herodotus, for example, um, an ancient Greek geographer and historian of the 5th century um, before the Christian era, wrote that cinnamon was coming from a specific place covered with marshlands infested by bats, where birds of prey would use uh, would build their nest. So those facts obviously explained why it was so difficult to get hold of and why it was so expensive. But in fact, cinnamon or cassia was simply coming from China, Vietnam or Sri Lanka uh, through, tr through trade. Um, so yeah, nothing to do with the bats and the birds of prey. The legends surrounding um, the spices provenance will last for a long time. In the 7th century, the Archbishop Isidore of Seville in Spain wrote an encyclopedia where one can learn more about black pepper versus white pepper. The scholar explains that it comes from the coast of Malabar in India, which is correct where it grows on trees guarded by dangerous snakes. A less reliable information. Because of that, and always according to Isidore's story, local people had to set fire to the plantation in order to collect pepper that would turn black after being burned. It reminds a bit about the forbidden fruit of the Bible story, isn't it? But from this kind of archives, one understands how myth developed around those highly desirable products. The land they would come from, the people cultivating or collecting them, adding a magical aura to their intrinsic value. As for the real difference between black and white pepper, in fact, it has to do with when the berries are harvested and how they are processed. Until the 16th century, exchanges with the Far East mainly occurred by land. But as the need for spices continued to grow in the West, it was impossible to continue to rely on foreign trade. 
So new expansionist aims, accompanied by progress in maritime technology, would motivate major European states to explore for further around the globe. Everyone knows that it is when he was looking for a new route to the Indies, a word then widely used to describe Asia in general, not only India, on the behalf of the Queen and uh, the King and the Queen of Space, uh, Spain, <laughs> sorry, that Christopher Columbus accidentally discovered America in 1492. Six years later only, the Portuguese Vasco de Gama would be the first to link Europe and Asia, navigating round the Cape of Good Hope. This is the beginning of a new chapter in the world of history, definitely, but in the world of botanical history too. This precise map, dated 1573, less than a century later, shows how Spain and Portugal shared the world between them, with mainly the Spanish influence on the west and the Portuguese on the east. You can tell from all the flags. From then on, important exchanges would take place between Europe and the so-called Indies. A wild competition started between the main European states all beginning to hunt for new botanical species as perfectly illustrated by the following event. In 1511, the Portuguese reached the Moluccas Islands in Indonesia for the first time. It is the place of origin of clove trees. The stem supporting the flower was highly sought after for its medicinal properties, but also used in cosmetic as an ingredient for Cole's recipe, the makeup. Quite surprisingly, it was, not, it was only available in this very precise archipelago. And to make sure to keep the monopoly of this product and to be able to, con to control the prices on the market, the Portuguese simply decided to set fire to the surrounding islands to secure their supply. By doing so, they seriously endangered the species and probably many local human lives too, but there was not such consideration at the time. However, the Portuguese, also busy in Macau and on the other side of the world, in South America and Brazil uh, notably, would soon be replaced by the Dutch, too happy to be the next one in charge of this incredible gold mine. This shameless rush for wealth was just the beginning of the plant discovery in the East. In the 17th century, and in order to facilitate and secure journeys and trade, East India companies were created. The British and the Dutch states founded their companies first, closely followed by the French and other European nations. If at first the company's business mainly focused on the spices, it would quickly be enriched with a wide range of precious products, um, objects and goods, um, among them new plants. The treasures found in Asia, passionately collected, scientifically observed and documented, progressively found their way to the West. Each plant needed to be carefully packed in order to sustain shipment and um, then acclimated to their new environment. Bringing back plants to the West was quite an adventure. A storm at sea, an attack by pirates, a sudden market fluctuation, lack of care, seawater waves, too much sun, not enough natural light, rodents or insects' appetite, or even seamen's greedy intention could instantly cause the loss, the death of, or disappearance of the specimens on board. First reserved to an elite, 
These new species will appear in Europe, displayed in royal palaces like Versailles, bloom in private residences, and early founded botanical gardens. They will then slowly spread to commoners' everyday life. And that's the heart of today's story. As you can easily imagine, hunting for plants was a very hazardous career, and people caught in this specific trade would go through a lot of adventures. They were really, I mean, they were real explorers like Livingstones or Indiana Jones. Their names and vicissitudes are still remembered, and I will recount some of them. These pioneers had to go through so many dangers and health issues. They were also dependent on the lands they had to sneak in, the local population uncertain welcome, their sponsors, financial resources, and many other factors, of course. Pierre Poivre, or Peter Pepper in French, uh, in English, uh, literally, was one of them. It was his real name and it completely fits his incredible destiny. From this portrait, we know how Indiana Jones really looked like. <laughs> Pierre first studied theology before leaving Lyon in France for Asia in 1741 to become a missionary. Settled in Canton for two years, he had plenty of time to observe the Dutch merchants and the huge benefits that was gained from the spice trade. This discovery would change his life forever. Pierre decided to quit the church to join the French East India Company instead. He convinced them what a wonderful opportunity it would be to introduce clove and nutmeg trees on the French territory. The climate of the Bourbon Island, today La Réunion, or the Isle of France, Mauritius, would be perfect to accommodate such exotic plants. The treasures he would bring back to France could then be used by the king in Versailles and the aristocracy. It could generate immense profits. But before succeeding in this crazy enterprise, Pierre Poivre would go through many dreadful experiences. The explorer first lost his right arm, for example, taken away by a cannonball while sailing on a French ship attacked by the English. However, it was a good thing, in a sense, because it prevented him to be ever a priest again, being unable to bless people with the right hand forever. By the way, how convenient this bust portrait is, as it doesn't show the arms. And looking back at the previous painting, one can notice how the painter cleverly hid the arm, the right arm too, representing Pierre holding a nutmeg in the left hand. Back to Pierre's personal history, another day in 1746, while traveling on the Indian Ocean, his ship wrecked at sea. The boat's crew was lucky to be rescued by a Dutch vessel, attacked by the English shortly after, once again. Pierre Poivre, as a French citizen, will then be put in jail by the British in Guernsey. Finally released after two years, he went back to the Moluccas, or the famous Spice Island in Indonesia, where he secretly managed to get hold of clove and nutmeg trees last. We are not sure how he succeeded to do so. The precious plants were then confided to a certain Jean-Baptiste fusé in charge of the creation of a pharmacy and botanical garden in Mauritius Island. 
during his life, the latter would also create an herbarium given to Jean-Jacques Rousseau, the famous philosopher, and himself a botanist amateur at his death. But the legend goes that, jealous of Pierre Poivre's success and growing influence, Jean-Baptiste secretly watered the tree with boiling water to make sure they would die. He then asserted the trees could not survive, uh, survive the soil of the French island. Too bad. Pierre will have to bring some more specimen that finally happily grew on the island and other places of the world, like here later in Zanzibar. From Pierre Poivre's uh, adventure, it is easy to understand how collecting plants around the world was not an easy matter. In spite of their differences, both Jean-Baptiste fusé Aublet and Pierre Poivre greatly contributed to the development and extension of the fam famous Jardin des Pamplemousses, or Pomelo Bot Botanical Garden, created in Mauritius in 1736. The pomelo it owes its name from mainly originated from Indonesia and Malaysia. The majority of the citrus family, lemon, orange, kumquat, mandarin, etc., is believed to come from Asia and goes back to very ancient times, in China especially. Numerous exchanges would happen during this period between the French island and La Réunion um, and Mauritius, which served as ideal experimental grounds and Versailles, where the king's garden needed to reflect his power by displaying the most fantastic unseen trees, vegetable, fruits, and flowers. Because we are mentioning the citrus family here, one cannot forget to evoke the famous orangerie designed at Versailles. It is an example of the Grand Garden's extension where the trees loaded with exotic fruits could be cultivated and sheltered. Versailles Orangerie House could contain more than 1,000 trees growing in boxes. Mainly citrus species were taken care of, but also olive trees, palm trees, and other fruit trees, as well as many spices that could be, it could be found there. During the winter, and inside this kind of cathedral-like um, space, the gardeners would regularly burn fires to protect the plants against the cold. In 1689, already Valentin Lepin, a very clever local gardener indeed, also created a specific transport machine allowing to easily move in and out the large trees in their trunk. This system ensured the Sun King and the following ones to always hold the most extravagant festivities as an image of their radiant power. And here with fireworks, another Chinese influence. The fruits and other exotic vegetables or spices would also appear on the royal table cooked for parties held at Versailles by the renowned chef François Vatel, notably. It was a real insignia of power and knowledge for the king to be able to display and entertain his guests with the most precious treasures from all around the world. As seen here in this example of Louis XV at the Place Royale in Reims, a cornucopia symbolizing abundance and power is integrated to the king's sculpture dated 1765. And you can see tomatoes, you can see grape, and you can see um, um, corn. The very same idea was conveyed by the so-called nature morte or still life genre painting, so popular in Spain, in the Flanders and the Netherlands in the 17th century. The very same nations trading all around the world. 
It is about being able to display your wealth through exceptional and desirable products. If this privilege was at first reserved to the king and the courtiers, it quickly spread to the merchant class that would become very rich thanks to the plant's trade in particular. Here you may observe rare flowers, like in the first slide, mainly tulips and peonies, displayed in a rare vessel, a Chinese vase with a European mount. Tulips uh, should be kept for another talk because it is a very interesting story as well. They are not coming from China, but from Central Asia, brought back by the Ottomans. Sometimes, also called cose naturali, or natural things, this sort of paintings would depict all kinds of priceless goods or curios, usually arranged on a table. And interestingly, rare flowers or fruits would often appear displayed in Chinese porcelain that also represented another highly sought-after product. Here is a painting with an orange as the main subject in a Chinese blue and white dish. My grandmother, born in 1911, used to tell me that it was her favorite Christmas gift, an orange. It was so rare, smelled and tasted so good. In fact, this genre precisely recounts today's story, the story of the encounter between the West and the East. Back um, to our previous story, it is also important to mention that during his whole life, Pierre Poivre, the spice hunter, you remember, was under the protection of a very important person, Henri Bertin. Controller of the finances of Louis XV, also in charge of the French East India Company. Himself fascinated by China and closely linked to the Jesuits in post there, he would become young Christ he would welcome young Christian of Chinese nationality to come and study in France. We know that Bertin was also personally invested in the, in the um, new plants that would arrive in Versailles Garden and the Orangerie in particular, he was also accountable for. So eager to learn more about the Chinese greenhouses system and flower forcing technique, for instance, Bertin asked their architecture and technology to be depicted and studied. An album of several leaves consequently arrived in France. It is today kept in the French National Library. Unfortunately, the notice accompanying the illustration went missing. This series of watercolors were made in the 18th century, certainly in Canton. It was com a commissioned work painted by Chinese artists Interestingly, it also reproduces a style of painting based on Western perspective principle with one single vanishing point of view. It is very clear if you follow the lines on the ground and on the ceiling construction. However, some errors may still be noticed on the side when you look at the rectangular flower pot or the shelves on the left, for example. It is not judgmental, but it is worth mentioning because it shows how the Chinese artists were learning from the Western technique. Um, and it was just brought in at the court uh, by the Jesuits and um, Giuseppe Castiglione in particular. We'll see shortly after that the very same group of Jesuits will play an important role in the Chinese plant discovery as well. So from the greenhouse paintings, it is e the Chinese style, it is easy to understand that the windows were covered with special paper and straw mats. So it's a very different system as the Orangerie in Versailles. The latter were unrolled over at night to keep the heat and rolled up again in the morning to let the natural light come in. 
A ground heating system that you can see here was installed, as well as containers with boiling water, not to water the plants this time, but to maintain humidity inside the room. Potted flowers could then be easily transported in and out. The same principles applied to Versailles Orangerie. From this document, we can understand the minister in charge of Versailles finances' main concern. He was curious of learning from the Chinese technologies, indeed. As just mentioned, um, and during the whole 18th century, the Jesuits settled in China were eager to hunt for new plants to be sent to the West as well. However, it was a difficult task for them to achieve because they could not easily go out. They were strictly restricted to certain areas in the south of China, in Canton, or in their Beijing quarters close to the Forbidden City. During Emperor Tianlong's reign, and in order to protect the Chinese Empire against the voracity of the foreign states and to control the trade, the so-called Canton system was developed. The Chinese saw what was happening all around them um, in Indonesia, in Vietnam, Malaysia. And they simply didn't want to fall into the hand of a Western power. And we completely understand why. Between 1757 and 1842, the Western nations were confided to Canton in the south part of China. The foreigners were subjected to a strict series of regulations preventing them to freely entering or wandering in the empire. Even the Jesuits installed in China since the, the end of the 16th century were strictly controlled first aiming to convert the Chinese to Christianism, the missionaries living at the imperial court were forced to transform into Western savoir-faire and technology specialists instead. The situation was difficult to deal with for, for them as scholars. They were very interested in collecting new plants, but they had no direct access to the Chinese lands. And as a consequence of that system, the empire, inaccessible, became even more attractive to the Western eye. I will tell you now about another plant hunter history, another Indiana Jones, Pierre Nicolas d'Incarville. He was a Jesuit that belonged to the number of those frustrated botanists stuck in Beijing. I could not find a portrait of him, but here are two Jesuits in their robes working in China a century before. The French father settled in Beijing in the 18th century and was working for the glass workshop, another Western technology important, imported to China. Duncarville was the first to have the idea to win over Emperor Tianlong's attention by using new plant species still unknown to the Chinese. Close friend with Bernard de Jussieu, here depicted on the right, carefully observing a plant with a magnifying glass, the intendant in charge of the Kings of France garden in Versailles, Pierre d'Incarville wrote several letters to his fellow to get, to get new seed example. Um, he could plant China. And that is how in 1751, d'Incarville received seeds of Mimosa pudica, commonly named touch me not or sensitive, Han Xiu Cao. Native from Central and South America, the species was introduced to Europe in the middle of the 17th century. This plant specificity resides in the fact that it responds to touch by rapidly closing its leaves and drooping. 
Two years later, in 1753, the Jesuit offered two stalks of sensitive to the emperor, who was greatly amused. Tianlong liked it so much, in fact, that he asked another Jesuit, Giuseppe Castiglione, remember, the one that brought European-style painting to the Chinese court, to reproduce it. And here is the famous painting of this plant, today kept at the National Palace Museum in Taipei. The scroll was accompanied by a poem written by the emperor himself about this flower of wonder. And subsequently to this event, Dunkerville gained access to the imperial gardens. It was a great victory. He was allowed to have contact with the mandarins in charge of the greenhouses and was also granted the title of botanist of the emperor of China's court. Not so bad. He was then able to collect plants more freely on the Chinese ground and to exchange them with new discoveries from France often coming directly from Versailles and from Kew Garden in England, as he was also in touch with a certain Cromwell Mortimer secretary of the Royal Society in London. From the letters he sent, we know that Duncarville asked for numerous plants, species from France like poppies, tulips, buttercups, anemones, carnation, daffodils, and the King of France emblem, lilies. In return, he introduced Chinese trees, like um, tree, uh, one that is commonly known as Tree of Heaven, the Chinese jujube, the kiwi, the goji shrub, or the Chinese indigo, used for tinctorial purposes to European gardens. Records report that Duncarville apparently pleasing the emperor with his new mission, was later promoted. He was named in charge of the plants, chosen for the Western-style garden of the Summer Palace, today called the Old Summer Palace, but at the time there was only one, so it was the Summer Palace, of Yuan Mingyuan, drawn by his fellow Giuseppe Castiglione, the painter, always remember. We know that Duncarville did wonders there. But unfortunately, this knowledge was completely lost with the sack of the imperial residence conducted by the French and English troops during the Opium Wars in 1816. Uh, Along with the building, the garden were completely destroyed and no documentation remained of their arrangements. That is a very sad loss uh, for botanical history, and it would be so interesting to know more about that today. However, this story tells us how intensive plant exchanges started both ways between Pierre d'Ancarville, in charge of the Summer Palace, foreign mansion garden, and Bernard de Jussieu, responsible of the King's Garden of Versailles. They had a direct ex plant exchange connection. It won't be possible to end today's lecture without mentioning another famous plant hunter in the late Qing Dynasty um, China, Robert Fortune. And Robert Fortune, like Pierre Poivre or Peter Pepper, bears a name that fits his destiny. This British botanist was first sent to the Celestial Empire by the Horticultural Society of London in 1843 to undertake a significant plant collection as it was written on his contract. That was the main goal of his mission. Later sent back to China by the East India Company, he was specifically interested in tea plants, of course. After hunting for species, spices for centuries, um, Westerners finally discovered tea. First arrived in Europe in 1610 uh, through the Portuguese and Dutch trade, 
This new product was named after its Futian pronunciation. From an exotic beverage um, drunk at European courts, it became very popular, spreading among the bourgeoisie and gradually reaching the rest of the population. China was the only territory producing tea at the time. Japan was still close to the outer world until 1854. So the Westerners invested a lot of money in the tea trade, constantly asking for growing quantities that would quickly transform this plant into a major economical and political state. This phenomenon encouraged Europeans to send pioneers in the Celestial Empire to identify, collect, and learn how to grow tea plants in other soils, not to be dependent of the imperial government anymore. However, concerning this matter, the Chinese was, were not really willing to help. They possessed an exceptional product that was as valuable as gold, and they did not want to let it go that easily, of course. That is how Western botanists, and among them Robert Fortune, would sneak in Chinese territory, secretly starting to hunt for tea too, along with other plants. Fortune wrote several books recounting his various journeys in Chinese territory that are filled with weird moments. Disguised in Chinese clothes, of course he was not allowed to go freely go in China, hiding his face under a bamboo hat with a fake braid. He could not talk the language, not even eat with chopsticks, so it was quite difficult. He and his Chinese guide went through a lot of fearful adventure because he, he was caught then. Yes, he could die. The history of tea hunting would certainly deserve a lecture on its own. And it is why we won't dive into this. However, I still want to mention that today, Robert Fortune is known for having introduced more than 280 new plant species, among them various sorts of tree shrubs, um, from China to the West, and for having contributed to um, the development of tea plantation in both India and Sri Lanka, um, Ceylon at the time. And of course, both countries were under British control. On their sides, the Chinese were well aware of the incredible wealth offered by the surrounding world. And for a long time already, they felt a prof profound admiration uh, for nature. So from religious belief to philosophy and literature, this fascination also found its way through their visual repertoire, forming into a specific artistic genre called flower and bird. In fact, if we translate literally um, this name from the Chinese, it is called flower, bird, fish and bugs. Chinese deep love for their flora and fauna inspired many generation of artists, craftsmen and amateurs. Today this passion can still be read through numerous works of art preserved in the Palace Museum collection. It is also possible to question the roots of Chinese identity when looking through the botanical world. Nature appears to be an extremely important component of people's everyday life in China, and it still is the case today if you wander around the bird and flower market here in Hong Kong. Observing how plants and animals were carefully rendered through arts tells a lot about Chinese deep values. The love for some plants very meaningful, like the lotus growing pure and unsoiled above um, muddy waters, is very inspiring in Buddhism, for example. But nature 
may also be considered as a good luck charm. Um, certain species, like the Lingger fungus, for example, adopting a shape resembling an auspicious Rui sign, meaning as you want in Chinese, will obviously become talismanic, also linked with longevity practices. Or the so-called Buddha's hand citrus, recalling the hand of sacred sculptures, whose long fingers position will bring supporting ideas for meditation, the famous mudra. Double gourds that cannot be eaten, but used for carving or transformed into various charming containers, this very specific shape also became a classical of Chinese imperial porcelain. And Chinese people love to decipher secret messages sent by nature uh, to humankind in the shape of a rock, uh, for example, often called scholar rocks or Yunnan dream stones, alluding to fantastic creatures or mysterious landscapes. And Chinese also like to help nature to recreate those auspicious messages, helping dwarf trees to grow in the form of a longevity or happiness character, for example, imaginary or real. And finally, the Chinese also like to make special flower arrangements, going back to a long tradition, assembling precise flowers in a vase chosen for their names alluding to particular values or associated with certain qualities, the bouquet will carry different meanings according to the opportunity they are offered or presented. And you may imagine that all those curiosities were observed, eyes wide opened, by the Westerners entering Chinese gardens for the first time. Everything was so different from the European tradition. Subsequently, since the 18th century, a new trend was set in the West for Chinese-style gardens. That was the case in Versailles for the Petit Trianon, planted in 1776, but then destroyed, for example. Still another story for another lecture. But what needs to be remembered from this major encounter between China and the West definitely are the plants exchange. And among the main species introduced to the West, many of the Chinese iconic plants can be found. Orchids, principally cymbidium, many prunus, prunus species, peonies, chrysanthemums, the magnolia, bamboos, but also fruits and vegetables like the peach, lychees, the Chinese cabbage, etc. A lot of them are reproduced on this English porcelain recreating a dreamlike nature, paying tribute to China. Um, Let's um, open a short parenthesis here. The wonderful paintings made in Canton, so very close from here, in the first decades of the 19th century, served as first botanical drawings to identify the species in the West. They were ordered by Europeans to local Chinese artists who learned how to depict them carefully following the Western artistic rules of rendering and shading. The gouache were then exported to the West, where they arrived into the hands of botanists and amateurs, curious of discovering new plants they had never seen before. Along with these new images, wallpapers with wonderful flower and bird jar motifs specially made for export, also arrived to the West. Chinese painters quickly understood the fascination their nature exerted, and that is why they started to work on these new designs for the Westerners. 
It would allow Europeans to recreate the magical atmosphere of a Chinese garden in their rooms or drawing rooms. European loved it so much that it gave birth to a new trend where local designers were prompt to catch up, soon designing their own productions. But to end today's talk, let's come back to our main concern. If many Chinese plant species were introduced to the West, a lot of foreign species were also introduced to China and during the exact same period. Today, Chinese may have forgotten that peanuts, potatoes, tomatoes or sunflowers, for example, were introduced to China through the Western trade. Those species came in mainly through Macau, brought by the Portuguese, that had just found them in America, and through Canton and Hong Kong as well, of course. There are many more things to say on this white subject, but I have to stop here for today, and I hope you enjoyed this fantastic journey between the West and the East with me. Uh, thank you very much. Thank you so much for this really stimulating and fascinating overview, both of the hunt for Chinese plants the, and the exchanges, and then, of course, uh, the reproduction in nature. Now, as the moderator, I get to ask the first questions, which is a lot of fun, and then we will open it up uh, to the public. So one of my first questions is how did the... Jesuits or the botanists searching for new plants. What did they base the newness on? I mean, some plants are poisonous, some plants you don't want to just try. So how did they know what they were looking for and what might be a success in Europe? In fact, they had absolutely no idea. They were open to everything. <laughs> Any new thing could potentially be interesting. Um, the fact is that the Chinese were really quick um, to catch on. They, they, they very quickly noticed that the Westerners were really interested in finding new plants. And as they were restricted to the south of China or Beijing, uh, very specific places like, for example, here in Hong Kong and Canton, uh, gardens were made specially for them where they would bring new plants to sell to the Westerners. So the Chinese were very clever. But then they had no idea about what the Westerner would look, would look for. So they would propose any kind of plants. Um, but very quickly, the Westerner um, were tired of the plants proposed to the, in the south of China because it was only like southern plants and they already knew them and they really needed to go inside China to look for other plants. Um, but they were open to everything um, and uh, everything could potentially be interesting. Like if it was beautiful to look at for a garden, if it was maybe... Um, I mean, you could eat it or, you know, any kind. I see. Thank you. Now, um, another question is just um, in Versailles, for instance, at the Orangerie. So there, the plants are a display of pomp and splendor. But then there's also the financial aspect. And was it also serving as a financial resource for the king? Or was it seen just like displaying jewels, you know, or was it sort of harvested and sold? Or was that only happening at the next level down um, by merchants who were able then to get the plants? So I think it might have been served as a um, reward. I mean, to, 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 he could offer that like some... Oh, to reward, to give to courtiers. Yes, exactly. And we know that uh, not only the orangerie, but there were gardens, really, where you had a lot of herbs, spices and new vegetables um, that would be used for the kitchen. Um, um, so we know it, it was quite magical to display those new plants, mm -hmm. but um, they would be eaten as well or put on the table as decoration, like the flowers and... Um, 
But that would be really interesting to ask Marie-Laure uh, next week mm -hmm. about if they really would use that like um, for as financial, you know, resources. But I, I don't think right. so. Yeah. 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 One, one other question. Uh, there's the medicinal function of plants and there's the sort of aesthetic function of plants. There's also the gastronomic function of plants. Um, how did the, how much were the Europeans interested in the medicinal and how would they have learned about the medicinal properties of some of the plants? That's a very interesting aspect of the plants uh, hunt in China uh, that I don't know quite well yet because in China you have what you call the benzhao gongu uh, all those kind of publication describing plants and their possible use for medicine, medicine, their medicine properties and medicinal use. Um, but it, I mean, I should check that, but um, it was not translated into foreign languages until very late. Mm -hmm. And it's not the first thing that the Jesuits would trans trans translate into foreign languages. So, um, yeah, I really but, don't... But they would read them, though. Probably. Because they created their own um, botanical pamphlets um, documenting yes. the different creatures and everything. And since they read Chinese, they probably would have... Probably. Them. Um, but I would say it was not their um, priority. Yeah. Yeah. And uh, it is true that uh, when the first uh, tea arrived uh, in Amsterdam early 17th century, it was um, not bring as a beverage, it was brought as, um, you know, medicine. Uh, so yeah, of course, uh, there was this aspect that still needed to be studied mm -hmm. and discovered with the plant. Finally, before I, I, I open it up, I just find it fascinating, um, the completely sort of cosmopolitan international route of plants coming from uh, South America or the Americas uh, going to Europe and then being used in this trade. Were the Chinese ever interested in uh, things that the Europeans really loved, such as chocolate or coffee? When did those, did they sort of turn their nose up, you know, in the 18th century? At the actually, beginning. Yeah, actually, I have absolutely no idea. Yeah, and it question. probably came very late yeah. to China. Guessing, yeah. um, we know more about tobacco, which right. is very right. interesting because tobacco was discovered in South America and brought to China. And it's quite unclear. There were several studies talking about that. And it's quite unclear because it reached China very quickly, like 16th century, something like that and Japan as well, oh. before Ch uh, Japan closed. Mm -hmm. So we know it should arrive very, very early on. So um, that's fascinating. Yeah. yeah, tobacco is something that's interesting to yeah. study uh, from this point of view. But for chocolate and coffee, I, I guess it came <laughs> very late. Uh, but some other things I'm sure Chinese don't even think about, like peanuts, for example, that are really widely used and eaten all over China. Um, arrived through the Portuguese um, mm -hmm. that just discovered peanuts in, in, in South America. That was the beginning, this story is the beginning yeah. of globalization. Exactly. Exactly. And that's very impressive to see that it happened very early. Very early, yeah. Thank you so much. And now uh, we can open up the forum to questions from the public and also online, I think. Please. Wait, maybe, maybe you need the yeah, microphone. Can you tell us about tea? We were saying it's a little precious in uh, 17th century. We were always told that the British started building plantation in the years after the Opium War. Yeah. But why would they build the uh, plantation before? Yeah, they started to look for tea for very early on. They were spending so much money buying tea to the Chinese. It was very expensive. So they were thinking like, we should start to have our own tea plantation would be cheaper. 
the Chinese wouldn't let go. <laughs> and they, we understand why. They wouldn't offer them tea plants for free, you know. So um, Robert Fortune history is very interesting because he really, he wasn't allowed to freely go entering China and collecting tea plants. So he had to disguise as a Chinese to go in. And uh, then he had to find tea plants that would be interesting. And uh, through him, the first uh, tea shrubs arrived, uh, as it is said, uh, in India and Sri Lanka. Uh, of course, he was British and Sri Lanka and India were under British control. Um, and that's how it started. Um, yeah. And there was a war, of course, the Opium War. Um, um, the reason for the opium, I mean, for the war was the tea. But then I didn't talk about opium today either, um, because that could be a whole subject as well. <laughs> very, very large subject. But opium was very interesting too. And it's, you know, um, it's a plant. Yeah. Thank you so much. That was really wonderful. I, I, this is not so much a question, more of a, a I'm interested in your viewpoint. And very recently, um, well, actually, we speak to Open Wars, but the writer, writer Alistair Gosh, wrote a nice curse last year or two years ago, which very much speaks to the year of globalization and of more so about environmental. Um, yeah, but the climate change and the fact that this year completely impacted what we're going through now. So maybe you could speak a little bit to the topics we've managed to hear from Yeah, when I started to look for like um, for this talk, when I started to build it and to read things, and I was really amazed to see how the connections between France and China were already built. There was like a privileged canal, uh, like exchange um, between, um, you know, Versailles and Summer Palace at the time, um, through the Jesuits, of course. But um, Qianlong was also someone that was so interested in, in plants and flowers. I mean, Chinese emperors um, really had this fascination. It's a tradition um, for the Chinese emperor for a very long time too, and. Um, so that's how finally a Tianlong uh, agreed, uh, Pierre d'Incarville, you know, um, to go out and hunt for plants. So he kind of convinced the emperor to let him do things he didn't want anyone to do. Um, so, um, yeah, I think this shows a lot about how the head of the state wanted to know more about plants because when he authorized uh, Pierre d'Incarville to go outside to look for plants, he said, okay, you can go, but uh, you have to bring other plants from France as well. So he really asked uh, for this connection to be made. He really encouraged it. So um, I think, so you can say that the Chinese were open to this too and very curious about knowing. Of course, he chose something that was very like, you know, um, obvious and very playful plant. But then um, the emperor really realized what he could gain from this. Are there any online questions? just chat and there's no online question. Um, so for Isabel, would you like to make some more? Thank uh, you, yes. Yeah, I could do a conclusion maybe. What do you think? Please, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> So yeah, I think it's very interesting to be able to talk about this precise subject in Hong Kong because that's the place where a lot of this story happened. Um, that was the door to China from the West. And uh, you know, it was really, so many things happened here. Um, and you had all those um, gardens that were uh, built up and open to the Westerners uh, to propose them so many plants. And uh, sometimes we forget about the fact that um, plants are a part of this encounter between the, the East and the West. 
and um, we often talk about wars, you know, and sometimes um, exchanges could be a good thing too. And I'm sure that uh, we were, we are all very happy today to eat potatoes, peanuts, tomatoes all over the world. <laughs> and um, I think that's kind of a very interesting subject. And it's very wide. I just kind of gave you just a glimpse uh, of this uh, today and um, it still is very alive in Hong Kong. You have this wonderful uh, flower market. Uh, you can go and you can tell for Chinese New Year how Chinese people are still uh, in love with nature and fascinated by flowers and plants and fruits. So, thank you very much. <laughs> thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.